Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Mike Kekwich. I'm an ethicist at uh, the Ottawa Hospital. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak with you this morning about uh, this uh, very important issue. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, medical assistance in dying, which is obviously a uh, new and, uh, and contentious uh, medical practice that was recently uh, decriminalized by the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, I'm specifically going to talk about um, the uh, lead up to medical assistance in dying being uh, legalized, the issues that were uh, considered by uh, the court, and then subsequently talk a little bit about um, the legislative framework that was put in place uh, through Bill C-14, which was uh, which was passed into law in June 2016. So obviously this is all very new. We're still learning a lot about this, uh, uh, this issue, which is um, uh, causing a lot of uh, important discussions to happen, not just uh, at the legal level, but also uh, within uh, various healthcare professional groups, regulatory bodies, and, uh, and we're also uh, awaiting provincial legislation on this topic. So just to uh, provide a bit of a uh, timeline on how this issue uh, developed over the course of a couple of years, uh, and it's interesting to keep in mind that, um, you know, if you, if you look at this timeline, things happened rather rapidly. Uh, whereas if you look at a, a, a province like Quebec, they were discussing this for uh, several years before they introduced their legislation. So this all happened in a relatively short uh, period of time. In February of 2015, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled in uh, Carter versus Canada that the prohibition on uh, medical assistance in dying uh, was uh, unconstitutional uh, insofar uh, as it prevented certain clearly defined populations of patients from uh, seeking access to this type of, uh, of service. Um, this uh, Carter versus Canada uh, case was a very high profile case uh, that originated in, in British Columbia. Uh, when the Supreme Court made their ruling in February 2015, uh, they understood that it, it wouldn't be reasonable to simply rule on such a significant issue and then immediately uh, put healthcare providers and healthcare organizations in the position of having to uh, deliver on that ruling. So what happened is the Supreme Court of Canada uh, granted a one-year stay, essentially, uh, to allow the federal government uh, provincial bodies, uh, healthcare regulatory groups such as uh, the Physicians College, uh, Nurses College, uh, the College for uh, Pharmacists, etc., to develop uh, appropriate processes to uh, manage this complex issue. So that, that brought us to February 2016, and in that uh, intervening time, uh, we did have a federal election which um, resulted in some slowdown of, of progress on this, this issue. So when we came to February uh, 2016, the federal government requested um, some additional time to work on this issue uh, so, so that they could feel confident that, that what they were uh, putting out was uh, well thought out and, uh, and reasonable. So they had asked for, for six months and uh, the Supreme Court uh, gave four months uh, in response. So uh, when the Supreme Court allowed for that four month period of time, they also allowed that uh, patients could, under certain circumstances, uh, obtain medical assistance in dying if they uh, went to a court and uh, uh, provided the right type of uh, rationale or justification for, uh, for seeking medical assistance in dying. So 
That's why you might recall that between February and June 2016, although we didn't have uh, federal legislation, uh, there were patients who accessed medical assistance in dying uh, in a way that was in keeping with the principles uh, articulated in the ruling in, uh, in Carter versus Canada. Uh, that brought us you know, into the, the spring and, and early summer of 2016. Eventually, uh, on June 17, 2016, uh, Bill C-14 was, was, uh, was passed. And, and Bill C-14, uh, there was a lot of input that was sought uh, from different groups in, in the development of that legislation. Obviously, the ruling in Carter versus Canada uh, was very instructive in, in developing uh, Bill C-14. So uh, Carter versus Canada talks about uh, medical assistance in dying uh, being available for uh, capable adult patients with uh, grievous and irremediable medical conditions. We see that language very much reflected in, in Bill C-14. And there were also uh, expert advisory groups that were, that were formed to provide input on this issue. So there was a federal uh, external panel that uh, conducted a lot of uh, public consultation throughout 2015. There was a provincial territorial advisory group consisting of, of many experts in uh, law and, uh, and ethics. Um, there was a parliamentary special joint committee report uh, in 2016 that, that weighed in on this issue. So there was a lot of conversation that, uh, that went into the development of, uh, of Bill C-14, uh, which, as I said, was passed in June 17, on June 17, 2016. So, um, Bill C-14 is really the centerpiece of, uh, of this, of this uh, issue. It, it provides the, the legal framework for actually uh, delivering medical assistance in dying in an appropriate, uh, in an appropriate way. And what Bill C-14 does is amends uh, the criminal code, which historically had uh, prohibited this type of, of activity and now would allow it if done by a uh, physician or nurse practitioner uh, under the circumstances laid out in the legislation. Um, there is uh, ongoing debate about certain provisions in Bill C-14 that I'll talk about. And uh, I think everyone is expecting that um, you know, there will be provincial legislation that will, to some degree, uh, supplement Bill C-14 or clarify uh, certain, uh, certain issues. So in Bill C-14, there are a number of uh, key points for, for policy and, and procedure development considerations. Um, I think the core of Bill C-14 is really uh, the eligibility criteria for medical assistance in dying. That seems like where most people have uh, focused their attention in terms of uh, debate and, uh, and dialogue. So uh, just to briefly go through some of those eligibility criteria that, that are significant, um, to, to access uh, medical assistance in dying, patients have to have uh, coverage uh, under some Canadian public health plan, so we can't have patients uh, acting as uh, quote-unquote medical tourists coming to uh, Canada to access medical assistance in dying. Patients have to be uh, greater than 18 years of age or, or equal to 18 years of age um, to access medical assistance in dying, which is significant because uh, otherwise in Ontario there is no uh, formal age of, uh, of consent for healthcare services. So uh, this is an additional safeguard that was put in place for, uh, for medical assistance in dying that is, has caused uh, a lot of debate. Um, patients obviously have to be capable of, of making the decision to seek medical assistance in dying. So that's based on an existing uh, standard for decision-making capacity that's articulated in legislation like the Healthcare uh, Consent Act. So patients need to be able to understand uh, and appreciate and provide uh, informed consent. 
And one of the other things that's required is that the patient uh, has to remain capable throughout this process. So the patient needs to be able to withdraw their uh, consent or be able to withdraw their consent um, leading up to the you know, moments preceding, uh, preceding the, uh, the intervention. So that, that, that does limit access for patients with certain types of illnesses that could uh, compromise their decision-making capacity as they uh, move through the tra trajectory of their, um, their illness. Uh, patients need to have a grievous and irremediable medical condition. This comes from the language in uh, Carter versus Canada. They unpack this a little bit by saying uh, this is a serious and incurable illness, disease, or disability, uh, that the patient is in an advanced state of uh, irreversible decline in capabilities, um, uh, that they're enduring physical or psychological suffering caused by the medical condition that is intolerable to the person and cannot be relieved. Um, there's also, and Carter versus Canada talks about this, patients aren't um, uh, required to try uh, interventions or options that they don't uh, deem acceptable to them. So in order to be eligible, a patient uh, is not required to uh, explore options that, uh, that they don't wish to uh, explore. And Bill C-14 adds that the patient's uh, natural death must be reasonably foreseeable, which um, again, th there was a lot of discussion as Bill C-14 was being developed whether uh, patients with psychiatric illnesses uh, who would not be dying uh, in this way of their psychiatric illness would be eligible. And this has been interpreted to uh, eliminate that category of, uh, of patients. So the request uh, for medical assistance in dying needs to be made uh, by the patient in writing. They need to uh, have two witnesses uh, confirm uh, that their request was made uh, in, in, in a way that was uh, appropriate by the patient. Um, there are also restrictions on who can act as, uh, as an independent witness for the patient. So um, they can't be the beneficiary or uh, recipient of any financial or, or material benefit. They can't be directly providing healthcare or personal care. Uh, to the patient, uh, and they can't be uh, managing or uh, administrating uh, at a residence or treatment facility where the patient is, uh, is, is living. So there was careful attention uh, made to conflicts of interest that might exist uh, uh, for people who are acting as independent witnesses, and, and these exclusion criteria uh, put clear boundaries around that issue. The patient, once they've made their written request, Bill C-14 uh, requires that uh, the patient undergo two independent uh, assessments of eligibility. The, the patient's eligibility can be assessed either uh, by a physician or, or by a nurse practitioner, which wasn't, um, as far as I'm aware, part of the original uh, conversation, so it was it was uh, interesting to see that they, they added nurse practitioners probably as a way to uh, increase access in, uh, in certain areas. The law also requires that um, there's a minimum 10-day waiting period uh, between the date the patient completes their written request and the date uh, where medical assistance in dying is provided uh, to the patient. So this serves in a way as a, as a reflection period for the patient so they can uh, consider whether this is something they still want to uh, pursue. Uh, in, and in recognition that there might be exceptional circumstances, Bill C-14 does allow for this 10-day uh, waiting period to be shortened under certain circumstances, specifically if the patient is at imminent risk of losing their uh, 
decision-making capacity, um, that waiting period could be shortened because if, they, if the patient loses their decision-making capacity, uh, they no longer are eligible. And also, the waiting period can be shortened if the patient is at imminent risk of, of dying. So for, under these two um, uh, circumstances, uh, the two physicians can agree to shorten that waiting period, and only if they agree can it actually uh, be, be shortened. So this is really the core of, of Bill C-14. Um, some outstanding questions that, that are still being discussed um, uh, include the issue of, uh, of mental illness that I, that I touched on and whether, um, whether it's uh, right that certain that patients with certain types of illnesses would be, would be excluded. And there's been a lot of uh, good uh, discussion, I think, about that. There's this issue of mature minors. So because of the age restriction, a lot of uh, different groups have argued that um, this might be uh, an arbitrary distinction, whereas others have argued that uh, it's an appropriate safeguard, uh, considering the, the gravity of the decision that, uh, that the patient is, is making. And the other one that, that is also being discussed is the issue of advanced directives. So um, whereas you can make an advanced directive for other healthcare decisions, uh, you cannot make an advanced directive for, for medical assistance in dying. You need to be able to withdraw your consent throughout the entirety of the, uh, the process. So uh, that also has raised questions of um, why it would be appropriate to provide advance consent for some uh, healthcare services, but not for others. So I think there will continue to be uh, debate at um, uh, the provincial and, and federal levels about uh, about those issues, and we're also, like I said, expecting that um, that the provincial government will weigh in on this at some point. The other uh, practical issue that that's worth touching on is that uh, currently cases where medical assistance in dying are uh, completed need to be reported to the uh, coroner, uh, the coroner's office in Ontario. So um, when when the procedure is done, the healthcare provider has an obligation to notify the coroner. The coroner then has the responsibility to uh, complete uh, some type of review or investigation um, uh, and then uh, come to a conclusion about, about whether things were done in the, uh, the appropriate way. Other practical issues that, that are still being explored are around things like uh, organ donation and, and how to uh, manage patients who are uh, requesting medical assistance in dying but also wish to be uh, organ donors. There's a lot of discussion about when is an appropriate time to raise the issue of organ donation with a patient who's uh, exploring medical assistance in dying. And the other issue which I, I failed to mention earlier which is a, a significant issue with this with this uh, conversation about medical assistance in dying is around conscientious objections. So, um, you know, independently of medical assistance in dying, there have always been uh, issues where healthcare providers have uh, been able to, to, to some degree, exercise a right to conscientious objection if they, if they feel like participation in the practice uh, compromises their own uh, moral uh, or religious uh, or philosophical values, uh, and that's no different with medical assistance in dying. So, uh, healthcare providers are not compelled to uh, participate in the provision of, of medical assistance in dying. Uh, there are existing requirements, for example, from the College of Physicians and Surgeons around uh, making effective and timely referrals when, uh, when a physician conscientiously objects and those requirements uh, appear to uh, apply to medical assistance in dying as well, which, which again has, uh, has caused uh, some conversation and disagreement about how far uh, the right to conscientious objection should, uh, should extend. So this issue really has, 
stimulated some, some uh, vigorous conversation about uh, existing, uh, existing practices and, and, and new ones as well. So that's, um, that's the overview that I wanted to provide on, uh, on medical assistance in dying. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a new issue that has a lot of uh, nuances and also a lot of uh, technical uh, administrative requirements. So I think uh, providing some basic information on how this process actually uh, moves forward and, and more specifically which types of patients can uh, move forward in that process is, is an important uh, way to start this discussion. And uh, I'm sure we'll continue to have more uh, conversations like this moving forward. Thank you.